Well, hello and welcome everybody to our webinar today, which is about how to get hired during COVID. Now, we've been helping people to find work for 30 years. How to convince somebody in front of you that you are the right candidate for the job. But of course, all of that has changed during COVID. Instead of being in a physical room, we're now in the virtual room. Today, I want to share with you all of the techniques that I would suggest if somebody is looking for work for the first time virtually or has been struggling over the last few months to get themselves noticed in the room. But how do you get into that room in the first place? Well, today I'm delighted to be joined by Laurie McPherson, AKA the fairy job mother. And Laurie, as well as being an SQA qualified assessor, She's also spent a large part of her career in employability. So Laurie, very welcome to you. And tell me, what's it been like for somebody, for a candidate working in this space in the last eight months and, and looking for work? It's been very, very tough. Um, the usual rules have kind of stopped applying. Um, people are just feeling exceptionally frustrated with applying for lots and lots of jobs and not ever, ever hearing back. Um, sending things out into the ether that they're really excited about that would really work well for them and it never, ever going anywhere. Um, coming across very, very quick rejections, which suggests that it's not a human looking at them and all sorts of other things that are just really, really knocking their confidence um, right now. And also, you know, people say, no, I'll just get any job, but then finding that they can't even get a job that they're massively overqualified for because other people are selling themselves better for those roles as well. So sitting in a kind of no man's land of can't get your own type of job, can't get another type of job, and really lacking and losing confidence by the day that you will ever get another job. Well, it's interesting you mentioned confidence because that can only be hit if you're getting 10 rejections every single day. How does somebody new to this begin? I understand why people say, oh, I'll do anything or I'll take anything and think that's been really helpful to recruiters. But actually, the more specific you can be, the more you can start to show up as a bit of an expert in that area, the more you can tailor and target your LinkedIn and how you how you find people, who you talk to, the sort of work you're looking at. It's much easier for someone else to talk about you if they know exactly what you want, as opposed to I know a woman who's looking for a job. Um, so I would start with what do I actually want to do now? And what do I actually want to do longer term? There's another big barrier here, isn't there? As a, uh, on top of uncertainty on, on uh, the industry, confidence. So in Scotland in particular, we're very bad at blowing our own trumpet. And this, I expect, will have been exacerbated by COVID. A lot of people will be retreating into their shell. And therefore, when you're writing, for example, CVs, covering letters, introducing yourself via LinkedIn, you need some help then to bring out the real gems, the things that you've achieved that make you stand out. Totally, that's, that's the bit that I have the most frustration about on a daily basis. You know, I see people who've done the job for 25 years who, when I change the CV for them and I put the word specialist or expert in there, they, they go, I can't, I can't call myself an expert. Um, and I say, well, you've done it for 25 years. If you can't be an expert by now, who, you know, who do you think is the expert? Um, my boss. So, you know, how did she get to it? Well, she did. So are you not, are you not done all that too? It's, it's, you're so right, especially in Scotland, we have a real issue with selling ourselves. Um, I, I, the other day someone said, if I go on LinkedIn, folk might see me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's kind of the idea. You know, and it's like, what about if my Auntie Nelly sees that I've called myself an expert and she'll say, who do you think you are? You know, it's all of that sort of real massive barriers to confidence, imposter syndrome, um, but people like me don't do those kind of jobs. All of this sort of stuff that stops people telling me their achievements um, in a clear way that then I can translate for employers. So, for example, you know, you, you may have raised five million pounds for your charity, but you don't tell me that. So if you don't tell me, I don't know. And the employer doesn't know. I don't know if you've raised 500 pounds, you know, and, and people laugh when you say that, but you don't know unless you explicitly state it. And that's the thing at the moment, you're having to explicitly state how wonderful you are, harder than ever before, at a time when people are less confident than ever before. So we've got this massive thing in the middle, which is 
how do I actually do that? And how do I make myself sound amazing when I actually feel I've just had 50 rejections and I feel really not that sure about myself as an expert and a specialist. I don't know if I want to do this thing anymore anyway. And um, it's all a little bit, it's all very, very difficult. And there's this kind of space in the middle where you go, right, this is where we have to take a slightly different approach at the moment and forget everything you think you know about CVs, cover letters, all of that stuff. Well, I want to come on to CVs, cover letters and LinkedIn in just a second. You mentioned the words imposter syndrome. Just tell the audience listening to this, what do you mean by that? So that's the bit where you believe that every day you're going to get found out. <laughs> you go into yeah. your nice office and, you know, you think somebody's going to find out that I, I, can't, I shouldn't really be doing this. And, and I know for a fact for, you know, that it impacts people at the highest of levels. This is an interesting conversation, actually. I was having it with a friend yesterday. Everyone thinks that everyone else has totally got it sorted career-wise, yeah. that they've had this blinding light. They've maybe wakened up during the night in a pool of, I want to be a, you know, data analyst. It doesn't work like that. It's all about doing a bit of this, a bit of that, finding yourself there. I fell into this. I found out that I liked it and I was good at it. You know, I think lots of folk are waiting for the, the fork in the sky and it, it's not coming. Let me start, if I, if I can, on LinkedIn. So how can you use LinkedIn really effectively to, to network and, and find the right people in the right positions, Laurie? So for me, it all stems from LinkedIn's about marketing yourself as if you were a business. So this is a bit of a novel concept, but bear with me. Um, if you opened a flower shop tomorrow, Andrew, you would have a lovely opening and all your friends and family would come and buy flowers. That's great. What happens next? So it's, you know, it's Friday, it's a bit geek out there and there's lots of uncertainty in the world, but you need to sell flowers. You wouldn't be able to just a sort of tinker with LinkedIn or sort of, which is what people say to me, I sort of use LinkedIn. What does that mean? So you can absolutely get new employment recruiters contacting you cold, hiring managers coming at you on LinkedIn without having to do 6 million applications on Indeed or any other job site. They can come to you but you have to set it up for that. So you have to look at your headline. So open to work is great, but open to work for what? No recruiter is searching open to work. So what are your skills? It's using those 120 characters, top tip, you get more if you use an iPhone, um, to get your headline right, use your skills. So if you're a business analyst, you know, fence post, growth, fence post, strategy, you know, that's the sort of keywords they'll be searching for. Use your about to sell you. This is this. This is where business people and employees sometimes struggle in, in the difference. It's your sales page. LinkedIn is a sales page. LinkedIn is how you sell yourself. It's not about worrying about who sees or who knows you. It's how you sell yourself and the roles you've been in. And it looks exactly how you want it to look. So you talk about yourself. You use your kind of best bits from your personal summary, your best achievements to show how you are on LinkedIn. And then the bit that this is the, the bit that nobody knows, you can find people you don't know on LinkedIn. LinkedIn doesn't have to be about all your former colleagues who know you and say, oh, there's Sandra thinking that she's an expert now. It doesn't need to be that. LinkedIn can be you actively targeting. And again, employees get a bit about the word targeting you're actively targeting people in the industry you want to go into or be in or are in or who recruit so there's the bit that people don't know you can do is go into the people bar and search people you don't know in your industry by using the filters lots of folk don't know that that exists they just look for somebody i used to work with name or oh, she's not on it end of story you know but actually if you're a business owner you know, you can actually add, I think it's about between 50 and 70 new connections a day in your sector. So you're in travel, you want a new job in travel, for example, and you're in Glasgow, you can go in and you can, you can go into the people bar on the left hand side and you can see, you know, Glasgow travel and search and connect with as many of those as you can. If I, Laurie, if I'm looking to build connections then on LinkedIn with people I believe may hire me or put me in front of somebody who will what do I say in the limited number of characters I have to make that request to them? So connection request is one of the most controversial um, subjects on LinkedIn. I do not use any words at all for a connection request. I believe that people can understand why you want to connect with them. It's a professional platform. That's it. Some people only want people with a message. Um, I kind of follow a particular LinkedIn guru who's 
bother with connection requests, just connect ads. People understand why you're looking at them. I help women who are predominantly women who are not working. Um, and I've looked at sectors like travel, hospitality events. I get, they, they understand why I'm adding them. I think um, if you are a woman who's always worked in travel or a man who's always worked in hospitality or whatever, and you add folk in your sector, they understand you don't need to send a message as far as I'm concerned. This is my advice and I'm very well aware that others won't accept you without a request and all of this stuff. What I would say is that there's two kind of thoughts camps to this. One is I'm quite people who are quite precious about their LinkedIn connections and others who are open to anyone who wants to add them or be added by them. Um, if they turn out to be a pest, you delete and block. That's completely fine. You know, if they ask you to move to Utah to, to connect hearts and minds, it does happen every week to me. Don't ask me why then you delete and block. But in the, in the initial instance, you add everyone who wants to add you and you connect with the people who you want to connect with. So I don't bother with a connection message. Um, I just think, do you know what? We're all out there to get business and be hired and talk to other people in our sector. That's what it's for. Good. And finally then on LinkedIn, what about when you get that connection request, you have that person in your your, your target zone what can you do to make yourself stand out even more to them you, so first of all if, if you are out of work i would recommend you do a flare post which is where you tell everyone that you're here that you're looking for work and can they like and share now i've seen this done really really well i'm just a girl standing in front of linkedin asking someone to find her a job was one of my clients beautiful posts and um, which got masses of likes and traction um, I've seen someone else, one of my lovely clients, put up a post and a dentist from Boston said, hi, I'll connect, which is very useless as she's in Glasgow. Yeah. But, you know, put the flare post up. Don't beg. Don't tell me that you've been at work for X amount of months now and you made X amount, you know. That's not what an employer wants to read. No one owes you an interview. No one owes you their time. Let's remember that. Let's remember that it's an employer's market. But be smart. Put a smart post up saying, I'm looking for work. Here's the sort of things I can do. I would love it if you would like and share. It's your flair. And then this person who's now in your sphere is attracted to you by your content, by your liking and sharing of their content. If, if you like it, again, you know, if you like it, if you don't, don't do it just, to, just for the sake of it. You know, you, folk find it easier to start sort of sharing other people's stuff and sharing other articles. So, you know, go into Google Property Sector Glasgow, look for reports from the last 24 hours. You can, you can filter it, share that. Um, shares get rubbish traction, but it's just to show that, start to talk about you, you, start to show that you're an expert. You start to talk about, you know, great news to see that this is happening, great to see that this is happening. Despite the uncertainty, I've heard that X, you know, holiday parks have done this this year. Here's something that's happening and why. Show that you know what you're talking about. Like and share other folks' posts and then start to put your own content out there. Um, it can be more personal. You know, there's also the whole LinkedIn police. This is not Facebook. Yeah, we know that. But, you know, we buy from other human beings. So if someone knows that you've got a, link, a link in common, you know, at the weekends I often put more, per I don't mean personal as in my deepest, darkest, but, you know, more personal about me that I, that I like musicals. I've, I've shared that before or, you know, something like that. That if people go, oh, oh I like musicals too. It, it sounds so silly, but it's like, oh, here's something we have in common other than this is just an, a robot who's a data analyst. Well, I, I'm also a musicals lover and a data analyst. Maybe we can connect. And it's also that bit about don't see anyone on there as your competition. It's collaboration every single step of the way who could potentially help you to get a job who's in a job who who knows what's happening who knows what's coming up better than those already in the industry so it's shown that you're an expert being seen and being seen shown that you're a human being and starting to get noticed for your traction and to do that you need to post consistently you know once every three weeks for me it's a bit like going to the gym andrew it doesn't work if you only really do it once every three weeks yeah yeah, I can, I can give you I can give you first-hand experience of that, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> but I, I like that. So, so collaboration over competition. All day long. So I'm friends with other CV writers on there. We chat a lot. I could get get nervous or paranoid that they're better than me, or that they're doing better than me, or that they've got more clients than me. Actually, we share frustrations and messages, and oh my goodness, you know, I can't believe. Have you seen this nasty recruiter's post about CV writers? Let's all jump on it. Um, for example, you know, um, we and actually, it's like, do you know, I, I'm I'm too busy just now. Do you want to take this guy, or do you know, you you're good at all that? What do you want to do? Stuff. I, I hate all that. I just want to do the right the CV here's a class, well, past business, you know, one of them is exec level. And I've said, as I started out, 
she's a little bit too, when they start talking in the billions, I get a little bit scared. Do you want this client? And yep, absolutely. So we pack, you, can, you can actually collaborate. Someone phoned me last week who is in the HR space, who wants to start doing what I do, but we get on great and she wants to pass me business, but she was kind of slightly sort of saying, I don't want to tread on toes. So it's collaboration all day long. There'll be clients you don't want to work with. They're just not your, your people. They don't speak your language pass them to me, there'll be clients that don't like my style, I'm very, very forthright, um, and maybe she would do with her softer approach. It's all good. If you see it like that, it's all good. Well, when it comes to CVs and cover letters, now you've alluded to it there, there are a lot of people out there giving advice, very yeah. mixed, often poor. Cut through it for us. So use your best forthright uh, communication here. What can somebody who is compiling CVs, sending hundreds of them off every week, what can they do to make theirs stand out? First of all, stop sending hundreds out every week. <laughs> you're being scattergun and you're not going to get anywhere. Secondly, yeah, there's lots of things you can do. Don't make it too long. Don't, you don't need to go back too far. As I say, it's not a legal document. You don't need to tell them about any job you did for three weeks that you hated. Your CV is your sales page. I'm not saying lie on your CV. I'm saying you don't have to tell them everything. It's curated for this role. And that's the key thing, it's for this role. So if you're going for a job in your own field and sector, starting at the top, you just want, you don't need to write the word CV. It just takes up space. You know, you don't need to write the word personal profile. It just takes up space. You just need your name, your email, your phone number and your LinkedIn profile if you've got it and if you've taken all the wee odd numbers off the end of it, which you can do just by um, fixing your URL and LinkedIn. That's all you need on the top. And then the bit that sells you is your personal profile. So a couple of top tips on how to get around the, the first sift. If the company are using an ATS um, sifting system, which they often do, and you have recently held the title that you're going for. So for example, if this role is HR director and you've been an HR director, have, your, have a, a title next to your name of HR director. The system will see immediately, oh, this person is what we want. And it's as simple as, as that. If you haven't had that title itself recently, you know, you can put HR specialist, HR professional as a title. It just, it's reading those words again. Um, you then want to be thinking about what are they asking for and your profile should tell them that you are that. So if they're saying they need someone with, you know, 20 um, HR professional with, you know, um, 10 years experience in retail, the retail sector, you know, your first line would be HR director with 25 years experience in the retail sector, having worked with brands such as XYZ. You know, you start with that and then you, so you clump all your bits together, give them a, a, an overall sort of number of years you've been doing the thing and then whatever skills they're asking for. So if they're asking for, you know, computer literate, co coaching, et cetera, you put all those into your profile. You know, proven skills and coaching developed through years experience in XYZ, you know, company. You tell them what, you tell them what they want to hear as long as it's true, obviously, you know, um, and as long as you've done the things that they're asking for, you then give them some key skills you also need to give them some key achievements. Now you can either do this in each job profile part down underneath, or you can do a specific section for key achievements. The key here is it has to have numbers in it. Key achievements have to tell me how you've solved a problem. So the good way to think about this is before you write a key achievement, ah, oh, there was that time I, I onboarded a, a wonderful new, I created a wonderful new HR system. Use the word so what. And that's really hard to do because it's your hard work and you think, how dare you? But so what? Oh, well, that saved the employer two days a month. Okay, so that's 24 days over the year. And then flip that round so that it's, it's really impactful when you say saved X employer 24 days per year due to designing and creating a new HR system. Oh, this person saved me time, can save me time. You know, say cost saving of X. Oh, this person can save me money. That's what employers want to know. What impact have you made? So this has to have numbers. What changed by you being there with it, you know, that wasn't happening when you weren't there? Now, sometimes people who are doing certain different jobs can think, oh my goodness, you know, I get this an awful lot. I'm I, I'm I just did my job, but my job is to make other people look good. I just did my bit. What did that involve? People say, I worked in a busy accounts department. What does busy mean? Did you deal with 10 accounts? Did you deal with a million accounts? And people will laugh and say, oh no, it was like, you know, but I don't know. And your employer, new employer doesn't know either. So tell them, 
we handled about you know four hundred, you know, handling X amount of accounts a day. Increased from X to Y, reduced call waiting times from X to Y, reduced staff sickness from X to Y, reduced sales, you know, increased sales from whatever to whatever. These are the sort of things that should be in your key achievements. And this is the bit folk find hardest. So you need to go away and have a think about what you've achieved um, that a new employer will want to know. And then underneath that is your um, work history in reverse chronological order. So your most recent first. Again, give them some achievements as opposed to just kind of duties and responsibilities. And a few kind of things that are a bit, there's no real, you know, specific right and wrong. You don't need to go back decades and decades. Um, you can, it depends on how long it's going to make your CV. If you've done one role for years and years and years, that's absolutely fine. But I wouldn't say you need to go back much past sort of 20 years ago. You know, you get clients that say, oh, I've got an award for such and such. Oh, that's great. That sounds fantastic. When was it? 1983. I'm not putting it on there because, you know, it's just not relevant. Things have changed so much and it just makes you look like you're kind of resting on your laurels. So rough guys are 20 years or four or five jobs ish. If there's stuff before that that's really relevant, just align saying that you were there and the dates, especially if it's for a really, really high level company. And then you don't need to write references on requests anymore if they want them the last for them. You also definitely, and this is a huge bugbear of mine, you definitely don't need a jazzy font. You definitely don't need a wacky, zany format. ATS systems hate them. And you definitely don't need, you know, I want to make my CV stand out is not I'll use pink paper. It's I'll show how I'm great for the role. And the other thing I would say to take off now is interest. Unless they are absolutely exceptionally interesting. So, you know, if you run triathlons, um, Iron Man's claim, you know, you're, you're saving, you're going to Everest Base Camp next year, absolutely amazing. That shows me a huge amount about your determination, grit, tenacity, etc. If your hobbies are, I always say, you know, like mine, um, lying along the sofa watching the crown with a, a big bag of crisps, it, they don't need to know, you know, seeing friends and family, that at the moment that's an obligation, we're stuck with that in lockdown, it's not, it's not a choice. Um, you know, going to the theatre, it, it adds nothing. Take it off. You've got these five page CVs that actually tell you very little. So sharp and concise, and I would say a good rule of thumb is about two to two and a half pages. Um, much longer than that, you'd run the risk of them just not bothering. And that really upsets some folks. They really want to tell me about that wonderful thing they did in X. But honestly, the shorter and tighter and briefer you can be while still selling yourself, the more chance you have of them actually reading it. Because you know yourself as a recruiter, how quickly you scan them. I think the last look, it was six seconds that you get, and that's pre-COVID. So at the moment, you know, just a point on that, recruiters are mainly working from home, working part-time, partly furloughed, have been reduced in numbers by huge amounts and have to fit the client brief. So if the client at the moment is asking for someone who can make cushions whilst wearing a green wig and singing Scotland the Brave, that's what they have to find them and they will. So, you know, remember that they will, they will sift it so, so quickly and they will search for the things the client wants. If you haven't got that, I'm sorry, this isn't your role. You know, move on to the next one. It's, it really is a niche job as well. It sounds like great fun too. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so fi finally, before we move on to, okay, you've been successful, you're in the interview. What about cover letters? Often misunderstood, often used just as a replication of the, the CV, but what should be on there? to draw attention to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Cover letters are great. Now, again, full honesty, they don't always get read. You know yourself, Andrew, if the CV doesn't, doesn't grab you or it's really poor, they, they won't get read. But that shouldn't be a reason to not write them. So for me, the cover letters in two parts. And the first part is absolutely key. The first part is why them? Why do you want to work for them in this role? And that's critical right now. Not why do you want a job because you've not got a job. Why do you want to work for this company in this role now? So if you can't answer that, I'm, I'm going to be bold and say, should you be going for this job? You know, oh, I, don't, um, I just want a job. It's not going to cut it. Companies can see a mile away at the moment through somebody who's looking for a wee job. I get that all the time. I just want a wee job. What's a wee job? No company is going to hand you their cash right now for you to sit back with your feet up. They've under massive pressure. They've had to pivot and do all sorts of weird and wonderful things they never thought they could do. They're hanging on to having a business by the skin of their teeth. They need to know that you want to be there. 
So we're looking at values, we're looking at culture, mission statement, anything you can find out about them, it's all Googleable. You know, for one of my clients, we found out that this family business was looking to grow by X in the next year. Perfect. She's grown family businesses before. So she was able to say that. That was the sort of thing that she's, you know, looking for this. She loves working for family businesses because of X, Y, and Z. Another good friend um, was going for a job in finance. And he said, you know, how do I stand out? Because in finance, everyone has the same qualifications. You know, if you're going for a job right now as a mortgage advisor, you're <laughs> Sorry to state the obvious, you're going up against other mortgage advisors. So how do you show that they should have you? And this product was about bereavement and about something that would help people who'd been recently bereaved through the financial stuff. So I suggested, say that this would have really helped you when it was, you, you lost your mum. And he was a bit like, can I say that? I said, you can say whatever you like, you know, they'll either bin it, how cheesy, or they'll say, mm, this guy actually wants to work for us as opposed to any of the other financial institutions out there. Submitted on the Friday, phone call on the Monday, lots of interview stages later, you know, all good because they saw this guy actually fits with our mission. We've created this product not to make loads of money. That's a great side effect, but because we, we believe in this product. So we want someone to work for us who believes the same as we do. So show that you want that role. Again, this week I helped a chef who's worked in some really, really lovely restaurants who's now looking for a role in a community cafe because it fits his mission and vision and because he's at an age where he doesn't want to work the hours of a commercial kitchen, quite frankly. How do we sell that? So I, I asked him, why do you want this job? Tell just me the, the, the truth and I'll make it sound good. And his answer was perfect. You know, I, I want to give back to the community. I want to bring quality, affordable foods to this community after years of just serving commercial institutions. Fantastic. That's the sort of thing that says, not just I need a job and it's doing the road, you know, which so often people just go for. It's actually, again, don't go any further than you want to, but if you can be a little bit personal, you know, said to folk before, you're going for a charity job. Did you have a... Sorry to ask this, but did you have a particularly a childhood that makes you drawn to this role with this children charity? No, I had a lovely childhood lawyer, which is why I want to, to help folk who didn't. Brilliant. You know, or having had some struggles myself in this area, I really want to help others. Go as personal as you want, because it shows them a human. And that's the way you're standing out right now. This human wants to work in our business. Wow. So the first bit is all about them and why you want this role. And then the next bit is all about you and what you can bring. And it's, again, the bit where you can show a bit of personality. It's where you can say, look, you know, I have worked at senior roles in retail for the last 25 years. However, the bit I've always enjoyed most was the people side, was the HR side. So I'm taking my qualification, but also while I'm doing that, I would like to take an HR assistant role. I appreciate that this is a, it looks like a step back, but it's me choosing a new route, and I would love the opportunity to do it. You know, it's words like actually they go, actually, this person really wants really wants to do this. That's a brave step to take a salary cut or whatever. Um, understand, so that they understand your kind of story and journey without, you know, without getting um, Gareth Gates and the X Factor Choir out in the background. You know, they kind of want to know your story journey, what brought you here, what you can do for them. And that's what's working right now, personalising it. it. It's really interesting what is occurring to me here. So the ability to, to stand out often is about a, a personal human connection as opposed to something you've achieved and when we're about to talk about what you do when you're in the room there's actually a step in between these two and that's what happens when you're offered the interview in the first place to me this is a big missed opportunity for people because at that point that's that's a first impression uh, on the phone for example uh, or or interactively by email you're making to somebody at that point, I would be telling the, the interviewer, I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to, to enthuse beyond other candidates to say, um, I, I really am excited about the opportunity to meet you and, and talk to you about my experience. That's the first impression before you even get into the interview room. So oh, agree. And people just do this kind of, okay, yeah, see you, you know, kind of right blanket again, they go into this. I think it all comes down to people thinking that this work work them has to be like this sort of automatron, whereas actually what's working, we're, we're in a different space now. We're sitting in our living rooms. They're getting to meet our dog, whether we want them to or not, because it's jumping up on our lap. You know, the doorbell's going, 
it's happened to me during webinars. Oh, sorry, that's the Amazon man who even even more embarrassingly shouted, I'll just pop it in the usual place, shall I? You do that. You know, we're in people's lives. So it's, ah, oh, you know, brilliant. That's fantastic. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, I can't help but show a bit of enthusiasm. If you're not enthusiastic about the interview, why are you going for the job? Oh, brilliant, great. Oh, I really can't wait, you know, and you don't need to over-egg the pudding, but yeah, can't wait to talk a little bit more about this opportunity. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, you know. And they'll come off the phone and say to their, their colleague, you know, ah, she's, she's, Laurie sounds really keen. Laurie sounds great. She sounds dead enthusiastic. Who wants that as opposed to, you know, automatron sitting next to them in the office when, when that's a thing again? You want someone with a bit of personality, enthusiasm, character. You want to see a human. So, so my wife is a good example of this. She recently took up a, a new position and uh, front and center of her covering letter was the fact that her grandfather had worked there for 40 years because actually this was her completing his legacy is the reason she got into the profession in the first place. So that's Amazing. that personal connection. And after that, I, I urged her to follow up, you know, phone, check that they've got it, remind them of how excited you are at the fact that the jobs come up. Um, once you have the position, be the candidate that's willing to, to, to go there and, and speak to them face to face, as opposed to virtually, if you feel it's a safe setting to go into, because even before you get into the interview, there's so many things you can do just to stand out and be the enthusiastic candidate. But totally. let, let, me, let me move on to, okay, what do you do now if you have been successful? You, you've been uh, impressive in the way you've written your covering letter and CV. You've got the, the interview. Now the preparation starts. And this is often what scares people. Yeah. Because how on earth do I draw out the limited experience I have and make it sound impressive without being boring? So my advice on this is that there are two clear structures you can use to prepare your answers. And when I say prepare answers, I mean, remain flexible as to how you get them across. But the one thing I heard in recruitment uh, and I've heard since I've moved out of it was, oh, they, sim they simply didn't ask me the right questions. That didn't come up. And that's frustrating from my point of view because actually you're in control as a candidate. You're, you're in control of every word that comes out of your mouth. And all you really need is the right preparation to go into it. So, two structures that I would recommend. The first, people may be familiar with, it's called SOAR. Situation, Objective, Action, Result. And this is used typically in competency-based questions. So if you're being asked, for example, tell me about a time when you led a team effectively. It's easy to ramble and it's easy to search around the room thinking which is the best example. Really, with these open goal type questions, you should know that inside out. And a sore structure would sound like this. Well, here was the situation. Here was my objective within that team. Here is the action I took in order to overcome the problem. And here was the result. And if you can use that sore structure to bring together five or six examples of things you've done what you do is you go into the interview with a number of ace cards, ace cards that sit in your top pocket. And regarding, depending on which hand is played at the time, you have an answer for each of them. Tell me about the time you did this, this, that, and the other. Ace of clubs, ace of spades, ace of hearts, ace of diamonds. There's the king of spades there again. You've got an answer for everything, a card for every hand. So what I would always recommend is, Situation, objective, action, result. Memorize a few short stories, engaging ones that mention interesting things and, and details that are going to, to give somebody an ins insight to your personality. Really get used to talking about them so they become conversational. And that means you authentically can get from A to B, question to answer, whilst making sure you avoid that situation where you leave the room thinking, that's something I really wanted to say, but failed to get the opportunity. Now, the second structure I would recommend is a sales technique, and it's called FAB. That's Feature, Advantage, Benefit. Now, you talked about travel there, Laurie. The, the, the very first websites for the likes of EasyJet and Ryanair, they would have shown jumbo jets. They would have shown airplanes flying through the sky because 
the early creators of these websites thought that's why somebody's buying a ticket to go on an airplane. But what they, they had realized five years later was, no, that's just the vehicle to get you to actually where you want to go. They'd rather be on a beach than in an airplane. They'd rather be visiting Sagrada Familia in Barcelona than be stuck on a 737. So what they did is they replaced the images of the jumbo jet with images of families enjoying themselves at the beach. Uh, in a cafe wandering through the Scottish Highlands, if you were, for example, a Hertz uh, car hire. This is called bringing the feature back and bringing the benefit to the top. So if you take, for example, a feature, and that's something you've done. A feature is something that, uh, a fact uh, that maybe on your CV, 20 years experience leading teams in product development, for example. An advantage is what that experience or that fact has allowed you to do. So for example, that it has allowed you to bring products to market more quickly than anybody else. And the benefit, that's how you're going to make your employer's life better. Then that's what people really want to hear. And for example, this would be the fact that you can help me as an employer get to market before any of my competitors. You know that I want to launch this product before them because we've released a press release saying so, and you could be the person to help me to achieve it. And if you really understand your feature advantage benefit, here's what you would do. You'd write down all the features, everything about yourself that you have achieved that you believe is going to impress somebody. Then write down the advantage associated with that. What does that feature allow you to do that makes you an advantage over other candidates? And then the benefit. How does that make my employer's life better? And all you need to do after that is lace your interview with benefits. So every single way in which you can improve your employer's life, start with that. So for example, if I was being asked, what value can you bring to the company? I would start with the benefit and I'd say, well, I believe I can get you to market more quickly than anybody else. Why? Because I have 20 years experience in the team and that's allowed me to bring products to market more quickly than anybody in this sector for that time. So, that's selling yourself. That, that's putting a filter on all your experience and saying, but here's what this experience means to you. If you can prepare really effectively then through SOAR answers for competency questions, fab technique to make yourself stand out, that puts you in great stead. All you really need to do after that is to be able to interact well. Uh, and I'll move on shortly to talk about how you get the setup right. Uh, how you can use some language to make yourself stand out over other people. But these, these techniques, they really are key, Laurie, aren't they, to your effective preparation before the interview? Totally. And, and the thing people hate about interviews, Andrew, is they say, oh, I hate it. I don't know what they're going to ask me. You do. We actually do know what they're going to ask us. You know, unless we're going to Google who are going to ask us, what kind of, if you were an animal, what kind of animal would you be? We're not, you know, 99% of the time, we know exactly what they're going to ask us. So you're completely, completely right. You can be prepared. But what about the tough questions? How do we answer those? Well, let's take a few. Let's take a few examples. Okay, so what about if you're asked about your, your biggest weakness, for example? Now, for me, my preference is to pick an actual weakness because we've, we hear this answer where people attempt to disguise a strength as a weakness. So they'll say, well, you know, I work so hard um, that it's probably too hard. And my, my friends would um, advise me to step back a bit, you know, stop taking work so seriously. If you give that answer at interview, it's so see-through. And actually, it erodes the trust that you have with the employer sitting opposite you. So my advice would actually be pick something that you've identified yourself as needing work. So for example, to say, well, over the last few years, uh, certainly I've been focusing my social media work on LinkedIn and Facebook. Instagram has passed me by to a certain extent. So what I've done is I've enrolled myself in an Instagram uh, class to get myself up to speed because if I can put that into practice, I believe after a few months, I'll be ready to go in time for getting this job if I'm successful. So pick something that's real, that's honest, and demonstrate what you've actually done in order to turn that into a strength. Other questions that people really dislike, give me an example of a time that you screwed up and something you learned as a result. Now, if you're unprepared for that question, you're gonna land yourself in some hot water. The brain has a, a, a terrible uh, way of going to the disaster scenario. 
And I'd been in that position unprepared as a, a candidate just out of university where I ended up giving far too much detail on something I'm sure cost me the job. So instead, give thought to, again, a, a real honest time when something did go wrong. Avoid criticizing other people. Avoid getting too down on yourself. But consider the solution as well. Situation, objective, action, result. What did you do in order to overcome that and turn it into a positive or a neutral result? There are lots of ways, lots of hard questions you can be asked, but as long as you pick the main ones, prepare an answer for them, what you can begin to do is to dip back into your SOAR and your FAB techniques. All you're really looking to do, I mean, great, great interview technique is getting from the question that you really didn't want to be asked to the answer that you really wanted to give. So other techniques for dealing with really tough questions are, are to give direct answers. And, and we, hate it, we hate it when politicians fail to answer the question. So if, for example, you're being asked, has there been a time where you've screwed up? Now, the, the, the tempting answer there is no, absolutely not. I've always done everything to the best of my ability and get 100% positive feedback. The honest answer is yes. So start with that. Use yes as an answer to uncomfortable questions and give people the unpalatable truth. That's how you build a connection. And then move it on to describe positively what you did in order to turn that into a positive. Similarly, the answer no. Laurie, would you be willing to work weekends here? No, I really value my weekend. So I want to work during the week and I'm very happy to be flexible in the hours that you give me Monday to Friday, but I, I would like to keep my weekends to myself. So using answers like yes and no, allow you to really assert yourself. And again, they get you back on to the points that you wanted to make in the first place. Now, a final answer you can give is I don't know. And this is one that people hate giving an interview stage because of course I should know everything there is to know about my industry, but that's unrealistic. There are so many examples again of politicians and celebrities who've got themselves in trouble because they hate saying I don't know, they make up a figure and it turns out to be wrong. So much more, much, it's a barometer of confidence if somebody says I don't know, I'd need to look into that in more detail. I'd be very happy to have a look at it after the interview and send you my thoughts. So direct answers to direct questions and prepare some of the more common difficult questions that you could be asked. Brilliant. Love it. Some great, uh, some great thoughts there. Um, and we have very similar ideas about how to answer these questions. Yeah, I once really tripped myself up with that. Tell me about a time you made a mistake at work and cost myself the job because I went into lots of detail about all the dreadful things I'd done, you know. Uh, yeah, and it's a good, it's a good point. R rather than expecting to be successful in your first interview, you have to get some practice under your belt. And that can be frustrating when you've yeah. worked so hard to get the first one. But dealing with failure is really important. If, if you do yeah. fail, and I use that in, in inverted commas, if, if you fail to be successful in getting the job, bank the experience, make sure you ask for the specific feedback and then work on it, practice with friends, practice with family around the table and get your technique spot on. Brilliant. So absolutely great. So what about the more sort of common and obvious questions, Andrew? How do you answer them well? I'm thinking, you know, why do you want the job? And the old favourite, tell me about yourself. OK, well, let's start with why do you want the job? Now, if I was to answer that by saying, well, uh, you know, I, 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 I just, you know, came across it on a jobs board. I was going to tell you immediately I'm an unfocused candidate and what you're absolutely right employers are, are desperate to find the right people right now to save their business and to make it thrive even public sector organizations desperate to justify value for money so need to find the right people charity desperate to plug that gap in funding so need to find the right people so you need to demonstrate that you've been on the radar of the organization for a while. So rather than saying, well, I just, I came across it and I thought we'd apply. I would be talking about the fact that I've followed the business for a few years. And when this opportunity came up, I just knew I had to jump on it because one of the things I really want to achieve over the next few years is X, X Y, Z. And if I'm in this position, then personally, that would mean a lot to me in, in achieving that goal. So I, I would, 
explain to people about your motivating factors there. What has put you in this position right now where you're employ applying for the job? The second one, um, which is tell me about yourself now, rather than people wanting a life story here, a chronological <laughs> timeline of events, this question is more about the why. Why have you taken certain decisions in your life? Why is it that you find yourself in this interview room now looking for this job? It's another chance to sell yourself. So make sure that you look at it a bit like your, your LinkedIn page. Prior, prioritize and promote the what's in it for me right to the top of that answer. So use that fab technique. What benefits about my experience and the decisions I've taken? What benefits will that bring to the client? So for example, uh, if you were to ask me about myself and I was going for a communications role, I'd say, well, I've, I've been fascinated by communications my whole life. And what I've really found important is to keep on learning. That's why I subscribed to ABC and I've done DEF over the last couple of years. In this role, my goal is to further that. I'm really interested in the growth mindset. And this role, I believe, will help me to develop that further and give great value to you as you go out and expand your network. So think about the why and stream it all together. Avoid talking for longer than 60, 90 seconds on this because that shows you're an unfocused candidate. So work on the answer and you should really, these are the open goal questions you, you should be nailing. Brilliant, absolutely great. So um, I think that the other bit that really people struggle with is the, the, the questions at the end, Andrew, the, you know, have you got anything for me? And, and we tend to say no, because we just want to get out of there. <laughs> uh, absolutely. So what, what, what do you think, Laurie, about asking questions of the interviewer? Why is it important to ask the right questions? I think, again, it shows that you want to be there. It shows that you've got a genuine interest in the interviewer, the company, the business, the mission, the vision, the values, as opposed to you do get, especially if you think you've not done well, you just want out of that room so you can phone your, your, your pal and say, oh my God, I've just said the most awful thing to an interviewer. You know? But actually, you, you want to be holding your, holding your nerve and asking the great questions that, that show, I'm really interested in this and I'd like to know a wee bit more about it. Absolutely. And um, the, the question I always remember people forgetting to ask is, what are the next steps? <laughs> so yeah. you, you, you really want to walk out of an interview very clear on an idea of when you're here or, or even what more you can do to put yourself in a good position. So one of the, the jobs that I got before uh, leaving university was an internship in the States. And the only reason I got it was that I was the one candidate who's willing to do more work after the interview than anybody else. So I put together uh, uh, um, two different types of business analysis based on, on a course I was doing at the time to give an outsider's perspective on their organization. And I said, look, here you go, free of charge. <laughs> this is, uh, these are two things, uh, uh, um, an analysis of where you are in the market, an analysis of things you can do to grow. And if I'm successful in this position, I would love to use this as a basis to help you to grow further. And they cited that as, as the differentiating factor. So it's, it's tempting to think when the interview finishes, that's your involvement over, but the fortune is in the follow-up. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. It is that thing about, you know, sending them a, a lovely email to say, thank you so much for seeing me today. You know, I so enjoyed the opportunity to discuss the position and the op uh, organization further. Um, look forward to hearing from you with, you know, um, the, the result of the interview or next steps or whatever it is. Um, just that little bit of, again, it's that this person really wants this job as opposed to just wants a job to absolutely. be out of, the, out of the job market, you know. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, really important to, to ask the good questions at the end. And I think, I guess the other thing I want to sort of ask you, Andrew, is, you know, the virtual interview, the video interview is new to all of us. Um, there are different things to think about here. So how do we get that bit right? Okay, so you want to replicate your environment as if you were in a face-to-face -face meeting. Now, we all know that, but how do you do it? The, the first, the simplest thing you can do is to talk to the camera lens. So that's here. And I'm talking to that just now, Laurie, because that's where you are. You can see me now speaking to you. But just notice the disconnect now if I talk to the middle of the screen where you are. And that now just creates a little bit of awkwardness between the two of us. That's what most people do because we like to see people's reactions when we're talking to them. 
But this is about presenting yourself. So I'd be talking there to the camera first. The next really important thing visually is to get your background and your space uncluttered. Now, we're all in different positions. Some of us may be in a, in a bed set. Some of us may be opposite the, the, our partner on the dining room table while they're also on a call. Some of us may have a, an enormous conservatory to ourselves with a light streaming in. But what you need to do is demonstrate to the employer that you've really taken time to make your background as uncluttered as possible. Because if there is a, a dirty towel hanging on a, a door behind you, it's going to say attention to detail may be an issue here. If you're, you're lying on your bed as opposed to sitting up, then is this person really taking the job seriously? If you're sitting up in the bed, but it's unmade, then what does it say about how you approach the, the, the nine to five? So do everything you can to make that very similar to a face-to-face -face meeting. What you wear is hugely important as well. Now, wear it a job interview right now, I would likely wear a tie. If it was an employer that I thought there was a 1% chance that they would also be wearing a tie because I'd want it to be as least, uh, at least as smart as they were. If it was a software skills industry, uh, for example, we're talking about renewable energy, then I would likely wear open neck shirt because that's what would be expected of me. But make sure when you're, you're interacting, now it's fine for me to look at the screen when you're talking, Laurie, because that's where you are, but look at that screen, get your background sorted, make sure your eye line's right. So right now my laptop is propped up on a couple of books, which it has been for eight months, because that means now my eye line is directly to the camera. So we feel like we're equivalents here talking to each other. But if instead I was to talk to you like this, then that's awkward. It feels almost like a dominant relationship that, that, that we have. So there's lots of things you can do just to get your setup right. Lighting, we talked about before. Make sure your lighting's balanced uh, from either side. And if you are at 90 degrees to a window and you're only getting light from one side, you can use a, a light ring or you can use a, a lamp just to balance that out on the other side. Similarly, always face a window if you can, as opposed to have one behind you because the, the camera will pick up the, the light coming through your window and you'll be silhouetted in front of it. Now, when it comes to your voice, now I'm using, uh, I'm using a, a microphone and earphones here just because I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old that could at any moment pop into the room or shout, Daddy, I need you. So that's taking the background noise away and it's ensuring good quality through the, uh, the microphone, particularly for audio only interviews, hugely important that people can hear you as well as being able to speak slowly, for example. Three words a second is a really good rate to speak at, so that's broadcasting speed. And to bring yourself down to this rate, practice reading some emails out loud to yourself, look at the word count, divide it by three, and that's how many seconds it should take you to say it. Because if you, only if you can speak nice and slowly will an, an interviewer absorb everything, it also has the added benefit of uh, allowing you to think ahead to where you want to go next. And finally on, on voice, enthusiasm. <laughs> you, you have to be your most enthusiastic self. That This may be the one separating uh, aspect over another candidate. If you show that you're more enthusiastic, that'll do 10 times as much as any CV or covering letter did to get you into the room. On the, the actual, the wording that you say, now there are lots of, there's lots of detail we can go into here. I'll avoid doing it now, but at the end of the, the webinar, I'll flag to you a free course that we have for anybody that's out of work. And we're offering 5,000 licenses. It goes into great detail as to the language of leadership, words that you can use to impress a job interviewer. And that's also available at 99 pounds uh, for anybody who is in work, but is seeking work. So lots of things from getting rid of jargon to speaking positively to answering questions directly, just to get yourself in front of other people. Brilliant, that all sounds absolutely fantastic. So any other thoughts, Andrew, on interviews and how to nail that role? It comes back to confidence. So, of course, there'll be a lot of people in, in, right now having had a lot of rejection letters, and I expect 
that's extremely difficult to deal with from a, a mental health point of view, um, from a, the point of view of thinking about your day and how you structure the next one, if, if you're getting rejection after rejection. I've certainly found that I've needed to be more creative than ever before in, in bringing work in. And the more creative you can be, whether it is sending handwritten letters uh, to people, uh, whether it is playing around with your LinkedIn CV, creating an Instagram page for the first time and following the right people. I would just urge people to, to be creative right now. That's what can make you stand out. I would also suggest I, I've hired two people that actually we failed to hire the first time round. And the reason I've hired them the second time was that they took it very well. Uh, they kept in touch with me afterwards and they demonstrated a huge amount of enthusiasm at interview stage. So rather than just ignoring the rejection letter or sending a one liner saying, well, thanks anyway, maintain a contact with that person. Talk to them at that point about the fact you'd really like to stay in touch with them. And if there's another opportunity in the future, you'd love to speak to them because that has you know, a couple of employees right now that <laughs> they're in that position. And actually, they're very good. I should have hired them first time, really, but very good at their jobs. So it's hugely important just to be the, the positive uh, candidate that's just full of enthusiasm at every stage. Amazing. That sounds fantastic. And totally agree with everything you've said. Excellent point. Good. Well, OK, what, what, offer can, what else can we offer you? Uh, so I'm going to put up on screen just now a link to our Thinkific program. We've distilled absolutely everything that we know about job interviews once you're in the room to get yourself out of it with a job into an e-learning platform so that's a, a series of videos uh, between uh, myself and my colleague colin which will tell you everything you need to know right from research and preparation through to how you look and sound and structure your answers and you can get uh, you can get that just by following the link at the bottom there if anybody is out of work and they want to, uh, to, to access that, we've got another uh, 5,000 licenses that we're making free this year. All you need to do is email info at pinkelephantcoms.com. Laurie, if somebody is looking for one-to-one -one mentoring to get themselves into the interview room, how should they approach you? Okay, so I have a free Facebook group where I give lots and lots of hints and tips if anyone is looking for that. It's Your Fairy Job Mother and Job Mother is all one word. It's a little um, fairy lady with a wand. Um, you'll find me on there. We've got about 500 members plus in there just now. I've also got my website www.yourfairyjobmother.co.uk and that has details of how I can help including CV writing and those career coaching and mentoring sessions if you're not sure what you want or where to go to start with. And I also have my Facebook page for um, the Grow Consultancy, which is a, a slightly different part of the business, but still deals with employability. And my email, which is laurie at thegrowconsultancy.co.uk. Perfect. Thank you. And what I'll do, I'll tag you, Laurie, in the social posts that this goes out in. If anybody does have specific questions based on things we've said or things we've failed to cover, please ask them. And Laurie and I will come straight in and answer them for you. So Laurie, thank you uh, a huge amount for your time and all your expertise and insight. I look forward to working with you more over the next few months. And uh, thank you to everybody for watching. Thank you.